All right, everyone. Um, please don't panic, but we've been boarded. Four salty buccaneers are going to have to come up over here to get, uh, and explain themselves in the form of lightning talks. So, Madison, Yulik, Miriam, Benjamin, could you please come forward to these seats? And explain yourselves. Um, Medicine can can come up yet. So, uh, could we show the lightning talks real quick from here? In the meantime, here's how it's going to go. You will have five minutes to deliver your lightning talk. After those five minutes, we will ring the gong, and you will be asked to please disembark. The anticipation makes it better. OK, great. Hey, I'm Madison White. I am a software engineer at Stripe. I currently work out of the Dublin office. Um, Stripe, if you don't know, is a company that helps empower and enable online businesses. We do things like process payments, manage subscriptions, and even help you incorporate. Because this is a five minute talk, the last slide is obviously gonna be a link where you can learn more because that's all I have time to do. But please email me, hit me up on Twitter. We really wanna hear what people think about what I'm saying right now. Cool, so I'm talking about Sorbet. The most important thing is how cute the logo is. Um, that's my favorite part. It's, it's not my favorite part. Um, what I really love about Sorbet is that it is a super fast and powerful type checker. It's 100% Ruby compatible, and it allows you to gradually introduce it to your code base. It's not prescriptive saying you need types everywhere. Add it where it, it makes sense. So we just open source on Thursday, which is super exciting. We have been using it internally at Stripe for months now, so it's been really interesting to see how our developers have been iterating on it as well. When we first kind of uh, brought it into the Stripe ecosystem, when I would write code, uh, there was kind of a back and forth between me and Sorbet. It would go like this. Uh, I'd write some code, feel really like self-confident and that I can do my job. Um, and then I'd go to the console, and I would run the Sorbet command, and it would tell me all the ways I had failed. Um, tell me all the types I'd messed up, right? So I go back to my editor, fix some things, probably add a new problem, go back, back and forth, back and forth until my code is good. So what we did is add a language, or impl implement the language server protocol, and we actually made an integration for VS Code internally at Stripe. It's really awesome because that gives you the power of Sorbet as you're typing instead of kind of after the fact. So now, because a GIF is worth 1,000 words, I have three GIFs to show you what this looks like. So say I am trying to retrieve a charge for Stripe. I've accidentally wrote charge ID instead. Sorbet can let me know, hey, charge ID is not a thing here, and I can really quickly iterate and fix. Next, say I want to know more about how to retrieve a charge. Right click, go to definition, see the actual uh, method, and hopefully, the amazing developers at Stripe have given me some documentation. And you can see um, uh, the method sig signature there as well. So I can see that it should uh, get a string and return either a charge or an error. Finally, uh, in this example, I've kind of gone backwards. I forgot how to retrieve. Um, if I start typing retrieve, Sorbet will actually give me some methods, as you can see. If I choose retrieve, you actually get documentation as well. So it pulls in all the comments that the uh, other developers have added. And then it also lets me know, hey, I'm expecting a string here. So it really makes it a lot faster for me to develop. I'm using the power of Sorbet at the time that I'm typing code instead of after the fact. Cool, so as promised, here's the links. Uh, we would really love you to go check out Sorbet. Uh, the only sad part about this talk is that we have not open sourced the integration for VS Code, uh, but we have given you the tools to build your own integrations. 
Um, I will say that if you apply for a job at Stripe, you can use the VS Code integration, <laughs> um, and you don't have to do any work at all. So come hit me up. Thanks. So we judge that you walk the plank. Will our next speaker please come? So, ahoy, here we go. My name is Miriam, and I'm a mom, a Ruby teacher, and a programmer. And for the past two years, I've been uh, spent, I've been spending the naps of my baby writing and drawing stories for kids about computers and technology. And by the way, this picture here is that time that he had a long nap. And if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. So I had some extra time to take the picture. <laughs> well, hello, deaf humans. We are mega, mega excited, said Therus, because bzz, you found us. Our size is bzz, uncommonly little. Bzz. Oh, Therus, are you running out of memory again? Asked Ona. No, I'm not. We live inside your computer together with terabytes of other zeros and ones. It is the binary world. We now live in a world in which our kids, it's way more likely that they get familiar with computers than to meet a cow in real life. Still, if you browse through children's books, you will find many farms and very few computers. So, what could happen if you tell your kids stories about binary code at the same time that they are learning to count? Or if they hear about RGB codes while learning about colors? And here, I'm not saying that we are raising programmers or tech wizards, you know, but that we are actually giving our children a broader understanding of the world that they are living in. So at the end of the day, they have these extra tools that will help them build the world that they want to live in, in whatever way they choose. So, but what if my child is not into computer science? Well, here's the thing, I wasn't either. Growing up, my dad wanted me to go into computer science, but I had to find my own way. So I went to college, I studied architecture, I worked as an architect for a while, I quit my job, and I taught myself how to code. It took me 30 years to actually find the creative, colorful, and human side of technology. And that's why it's important for me today to come up with new, original, different ways to actually introduce the world of technology to our kids. Because we need to reach as many of them as possible. Because today's world really needs many different types of people to actually start thinking about technology and to care about it. So what's coming? The first story, uh, it's coming out later this autumn, and Therus gets a virus, and Ona takes him on a trip. And will they find a cure? <laughs> These are Therus and Ona, and they like to share their adventures in the binary world. It is a human, unplugged way to share the magic of computers with our kids. If you want to know more about the book, well, you can do several things. You can join the mailing list. You can follow us, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can also share it with your friends, deaf, parents, humans. And you can come and say hi over lunch. Because it would be really awesome to have you and your kids on board. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, th here's your little treasure, and you walk the plank. Hello. Um, the story I'm about to tell is called uh, No Such Bucket, and it's about these things. So we run a service where you basically take some files, they come out on the left, then they go into a thing, and then they go into an AWS S3 bucket. So we're going to talk about what happens in the thing. Uh, we have tests. Um, because you know we believe in this statement, we test against actual S3 buckets <coughs> because we believe that the more stuff you touch, the more bugs you will find. So we actually have tests which create S3 buckets, which upload stuff to them. They check what's in the bucket. They check whether they can do things with multi-part uploads and other you know, interesting S3 features. And um, it was working well until it wasn't. And then suddenly, you know, first CI build, second CI build, third CI build, and we're like, why? How can this happen? Because our test creates a bucket, uploads something into it, and then the first call works, and the second says no such bucket. So we were like, hmm, this, this doesn't look right. And then we make an issue. It all starts with an issue. And the first approach is basically we look at where we messily create the three buckets and tests, and we just fix it, and then we hope that the problem will disappear by itself. So we do this, and we say that it's totally going to close this issue, which, of course, it doesn't. And then we make another pull request, which is supposed to solve this problem in a different way, and it doesn't help as well. And then you make another one. And then we're like, yeah, it must be us. Maybe we should listen. You know, and we should not run scripting languages in production. Maybe everything should be mocks. But, you know, before we give it up, we'll give it one last try. Uh, we'll just do this. We'll just try to create a number of S3 buckets, one, one after another. We'll try to upload something into the freshly created S3 bucket of exactly zero bytes. And then we're going to delete the bucket right after. And we're going to run the script and, what, and we'll see what happens. And maybe if our problem is only happening in CI, you know, we'll just run it instead of the CI. So, okay. So it basically means that out of 100 calls, we have four failures, which happen completely on random, and it's totally outside of our control. So we're like, hmm, maybe something is fishy here. It's time to make a case with AWS support. Uh, very scientific numbers there, random and often. So. <laughs> AWS support looks at it and says, hmm, this is not right. And so they're like, we suggest you check if the bucket exists before doing operations in your tests. We're like, hmm, OK, no, OK, mm -mm, no. 2% <laughs> failure rate. Then they're like, so we tested your script. And once we inserted sleep for three seconds <laughs> before putting your empty object, the number of exceptions was zero. We were like, OK, so. Um, so <laughs> So I don't know how much coffee you drink while you wait for your CI runs, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have to do something with that. You know, and they say, we don't have an official way for you. And basically, S3 bucket creation, it turns out, is eventually consistent. It can be inconsistent between calls that you make to the S3 bucket right after you have created it. The time during which it is inconsistent is not hardly defined. And the only thing you can do are opportunistic retries and sleeps. And this can happen with any calls to AWS S3 bucket. And it's an inherent property of the system. It's not because S3 is good or bad. It's because S3 uses a lot of load balancing and DNS replication and complicated stuff, which makes the read after write consistency hold for reads and not for writes. So I thought maybe Terraport people do it right. This issue is open there now. Uh, so we implement retries. and. How do we make every SDK operation retry? Well, we call it in many different ways. So if we were using a fast compile language, we wouldn't be able to. Um, this is my favorite article about this kind of subject. Um, so in the, but since we're Ruby programmers, we can patch it. So the top part is the comments, the bottom part is the code. And if you ever, and it, and if you ever wondered why you need mutable constants in Ruby, this is why. When your libraries and your vendors don't do what you need them to do, this is when you need to mutate a constant. Totally works. So 
great thanks to the AWS SDK uh, Ruby team because they make gems where you can find where things happen and you can change them. And for you, I guess this is the takeaway. Uh, most likely, if you're using big, interesting distributed systems that you don't fully understand, maybe you know when you open an issue like this, it might not be you. Uh, and this is a very nice talk about fixing flake tests. My name is Yulik, I work for you guys, so thank you. So your talk made it just into five minutes, so you'll be fine, no walking the plank for you. Just kidding, to Davy Jones's locker with thank you. you. <laughs> yeah, ahoy everyone. Um, my name is Benjamin, and I'm the maintainer of SearchFlip. SearchFlip is a full-featured Ruby client with a chainable DSL, let's say. And SearchFlip actually isn't quite new. So I uh, created SearchFlip back in 2014 first, and it's used. It's been used in large projects since then. So it's already quite stable, I would say. Um, I will rush through this. Um, maybe just keep uh, that I'm available, of course, at GitHub and. Um, you maybe want to check out the repository and stuff, and I'm very open for contributions all the time, of course. So, it's all about Elasticsearch, but why actually another Elasticsearch client, as there are already some out there? Um, let's maybe take a look at some simple queries um, and, and compare, let's say, two gems, for example, how they deal with it. So let's say we have a comments model and we want to search in it for, a, a, it should contain, our search query uh, uh, selects comments which should contain the text hello world, having a state of approved true such that we have some kind of review process and we aggregate uh, via username such that we get counts for every username and then sort by ID. First and foremost, there is a gem called Elasticsearch Ruby, of course, which is the official one. However, with Elasticsearch Ruby, you are actually writing raw Elasticsearch queries, which is like writing raw SQL queries, and who actually is doing that today? Um, <laughs> hopefully, only, hopefully only if you have to. Um, actually, writing raw SQL queries is easier because the Elasticsearch query DSL can be very complex sometimes, and you already see that this code becomes quite uh, bulky and error-prone, and you actually don't want to use it. Then there's a popular gem called SearchKick. With SearchKick, uh, most of the blot is removed. However, uh, when you take a deeper look, you will see that you have to maintain some kind of hash where you collect all your queries, query attributes, and then pass that to some kind of method where the results are, uh, results are returned. For my case, I would like rather, for me it feels like using uh, Active Record version 2 again, and where I, I would actually like to chain methods, and that's why I created SearchFlip. Because with SearchFlip it looks like that, and most of the blot is removed as well, but more than that we have a chainable API, and this is really great if you have, for example, to deal with some kind of param sesh from the front end, of course, where there are optionally clauses and all these kinds of things. So, how to start using it? Um, first, you create some kind of, okay, you first install the gem, of course, but then you create a, for example, let's say, comment index. You, uh, uh, you include the search flip index module, and then you say, uh, tell search flip how to serialize the objects uh, for indexing, because in the end, Elasticsearch needs some kind of JSON object. And more than that, you can specify mappings, index settings, all these kinds of things related to Elasticsearch, and most of the time they get applied to the index um, automatically. So uh, dealing with indexes is really simple. Now we can interact with our index, like for example, we create the index, ask if the index exists, delete the index, all these kinds of things. Import records, of course, via arbitrary active record scopes, for example, but it's not bound to active record, actually. Um, or single records, and we can even delete records by arbitrary elastic search queries. In the end, this is then what a query, a usual query looks like. Let's say, for example, we are, booking we are a booking platform and we have to deal with hotels, so we search for hotels, um, and they should, for example, have a minimum rating supplied via some params hash, 
and we want to only view hotels nearby, so therefore we pass some geolocations. And actually these two methods, where geo and sort by distance, are custom methods added to the index and they are then afterwards chainable as well. In the end we do some kind of uh, uh, aggregations as well, as well and add some pagination. Simple as that and actually it looks then like simply use an active record for me. That's it actually, thanks. Thank you very much. You walk the plank. So we have one more privating privateer. Norma, if you could join us on stage. Before we begin, since I'm changing hats, I'm gonna look for a volunteer who's willing to change hats and go sit behind my keyboard. <laughs> Seriously, yeah? Go. We can see what comes up. It'll be sort of a modern poetry at the end, maybe. And we can save it. Yes. Perfect. Uh, how do I do this? <laughs> I'm not used to doing this at all. But um, I, I called my talk a splash course on live captioning uh, because Ramon is not the only one who can play this uh, ship pun game. Um, so do we have a captioner ready to go? Yes? How do I do <laughs> Just Press keys, pretend you're playing the piano. I don't know if you know how to play the piano. Like this white thing? Yes. <laughs> Go for it. Um, I'm running out of time, so. <laughs> My name is Norma, and um, I own a company called White Coat Captioning. It's a very small company, but we also do have a branch in the UK. Um, <laughs> and uh, we caption worldwide, both remotely and on site. In, nine, uh, in 2018, we captioned 159 tech conferences, which was a, a shock to me as well. Uh, I had to ask my assistant, who is a math teacher, so I know she got the number right when she uh, added up the number of conferences that we did in 2018. Um, I was really excited to be invited um, to Rotterdam. Uh, we've captioned uh, this conference a couple of years in a row remotely, but uh, when I heard it was in Rotterdam, I was like, hi, I travel. Um, so here we are. I'm running out of time. I'm seeing the clock running down. So in my early career, I was a court stenographer, a court reporter. Uh, those are the notes that we used to produce. This is, those, these are my actual notes from 1982. Yes, I'm that old. Um, it was a murder trial. And afterwards, we, we would have to type it all up. We didn't do things in real time in those days. So that stack of notes represents about 1,200 pages of transcript. The machines have become you know, light years ahead of what they used to be. They're very ergonomic and easy to use now. Um, the keyboard looks like so. It's, so we want to give our new captioner uh, a, small <laughs> a small demonstration. Um, if, you, if you hit the keys that are circled in red, you can write the word start. And if you hit, the, <laughs> hit those keys together that are written in, that are circled in red, you'll write the word dash. This is not the uh, punctuation mark dash, which would have to be written in a different way. This is an example of what the code would look like. This is my little Yorkie, Mr. Jeffries. So this shows you what the code on the paper or now on the computer would look like for. This is Mr. Jeffries, written in one, two, three, four strokes. My adorable Yorkie written in one, two, three, four, five strokes. So yesterday, uh, we, we produced 51 single-spaced pages, 31,282 words. I had 17 errors. I was kind of disappointed in my performance because I normally hit 99.99%. I only hit... 
Yesterday it was on me. <laughs> how, how can I, my most frequently asked question is how are you so accurate? And um, big word, main word is I specialize in writing tech. Con uh, captioning. So because of all those captions, that, uh, all of those conferences that I told you about, um, uh, even though we often ask the speakers to give us their notes ahead of time, etc., we very rarely get them. And so, <laughs> shout out to um, Eileen who sent me a glossary as well as a video of her for former talk. Um, this is how you can help me to do a better job is yes, please. When someone asks you to provide your slides, don't be, don't be shy. Send them. I'm not going to do anything with them. I'm not going to steal your content. And, and next, slow down. It's not a race. You don't have to talk at 300 words per minute. Say less in a shorter amount of time. I have one second left. <laughs> Thank you so much, Norma. That was delightful, and a special shout out for our new closed captioner. <laughs> and don't think you're getting away. You too walk the plank. <laughs>